And then Jack, I would say, let's start whenever you're ready. Well, let's do it. Let's get started. And if people join us in the next few minutes, the more the merrier, um, especially this time of year, holiday season upon us. And But we're most excited to be here today to talk about uh, for those of us, those of you who know us, know that this is our favorite subject, me in particular. Um, I love talking about coaching. And we've been looking forward to doing this particular session for a while now. Um, so hopefully we'll we'll have some things for you today to take away and ponder about what this skill called coaching really is. Um, and I don't think it's hyperbole to say, that it is the skill that changes everything. Um, so I, I think you're going to learn some things today that may get you thinking about that as well, about how this is a skill that can truly change a lot for you as a leader. Um, but before we get started with that, let's tell you a little bit about us. So um, if we can just go to this next slide. There we are. Um, so Jackie Pellin and Courtney Smock. I, of course, am Jackie Pellin. You probably noticed um, from the window and the glasses. Um, so who we are, well, and then there's Courtney Smock, who's going to be jumping in and out of here too. We'll be, we'll be tag teaming this for you today. Courtney and I, we go way back. We've been working together a long time. Um, you can see some, <coughs> in some points about, you know, who we are, where we come from on the slide there. We've been around in really large organizations for a very long time. Um, we usually say like roughly 25 years. Um, we've been we've been working with people like you and organizations for a long time. Um, trying, you know, people like you that are dealing with all the other humans in your organization. Um, and we lived inside corporate America for a while. And then we decided um, to take our show on the road to help people beyond the organizations that we were serving in, to help people like you solve your messiest um, business problems that are, of course, always connected to people. And boy, today's subject is really going to just go right to the heart of how to deal with some of those messy business problems. Um, we focus largely on leadership and change, and we have a famous saying around here, change got you into this mess and leadership will get you out of it. Um, so we see those two things as going hand in hand. So Courtney and I um, are kind of chocolate and peanut butter to each other that way. I'd like to talk about leadership. She likes to talk about change and we do it together. Um, so today is one of those days that we're going to give you some practical tools and resources that you can apply right now because that's what we do and that's why we're here to help. Um, so Courtney, I think I'm going to have you go to the next slide and, and talk a little bit about um, some of just real quick profile of some of the things that we do before we dive into the subject of coaching. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it's easier to get to know a company by what they do. Um, we are we swim very directly in the leadership coaching space, which is what this is about. We do training as well. We offer coaching services and we have training curriculums and then we'll come and speak your organization. And then when we consult, we love it when we work with organizations who let us play in all three spaces. If you have a business problem where you have leaders who need coached, people who need training and some work group facilitation, and we can press on all three levers of that to create lasting change in your organization, we are happy, happy people. So um that's a little bit more about what we do and how we do it. Jackie, let's dig into our coaching stories. We're going to go on a little, we're going to tell stories today. We are. Look at that. It even says that our coaching stories, we thought we would start with some stories um, because I think that just even how Courtney and I arrived at this space of, uh, of knowing a lot about coaching and using it to help our clients, I think Lynn's it, it, it in and of itself tells you a lot about what coaching is and isn't and how it is a such a dynamic and and um, uh, important skill. So here's my story. Um, I'm going to just straight update myself right now. I started in I started in the business world um, in 1990. Jeez, I didn't know we we're doing that today. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I did. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw it out there. I started in, cause I want to tell you that because I started in the business world in a really interesting time. And I know I predate some of you now, and everyone on this call has a little bit different experience of when they, when they, you know, when they really went out there into the, into the world of work. Um, and, but I want to tell you mine, because the fact that I started in the early nineties, actually it was in 1990, um, 
it was, it was, I came, I was fresh out of college and here I was starting in this world of business and I had a lot to learn. I had a degree in psychology. I mean, what kind of psychologist knows anything about business? So here I was thrown into the business world. And I had a lot to learn. And what I learned pretty quickly um, in that time, and this was, I worked at a big company. Um, and what I learned was that um, decisions, <laughs> business is a lot about making decisions. Decisions are made mostly at the top of an organization. The big ones are made at the top of an organization. And then um, those decisions are really all about maximizing results. Organizations are in a, you know, are in the business to do something, to supply something to their customers. And so those decisions are all about getting results. And, and then those results are measured, right, through metrics and KPIs. I know you're all in organizations that you've probably heard about KPIs and may have a lot of those on your plate. So we get all the metrics and the KPIs, and you know, in order to achieve all of those things, and there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of oversight, um, and that's why leaders are put in place. Essentially, I mean, at this at this at this high level, that's why leaders are put in place is to manage sort of all those decisions and the metrics and the oversight of all of those rules, because people are messy. That is the most unpredictable part of a business. And I learned that really quickly was the people in the business are the most unpredictable part. And um, you know they're, they're, they're tricky because they have free will. They're different than your software, or your science or your engineering or your tools or your processes. They have free will and they will dismay or delight you. So I learned that pretty quickly as well. And um, I also learned that because of this, and I think this is something you can all relate to more or less um, than my journey. It, it can be really scary for organizations. The fact that, that there's so much unpredictability in the behavior of the human beings in the organization, that they are indeed the most unpredictable part of an organization leads to a lot of fear, a lot of fear and a lot of wanting to control, wanting to control that element. And, you know, so here I am at the beginning of the 90s and leadership development. And the reason I, I think it's important that you understand this was at the beginning of the 90s. Leadership development hadn't it was just coming into its own. Um, it may seem like it's a permanent part and like it has always existed in our organizations, but I assure you it, it did. It did not. It was starting to build in the 80s and then it really came on the scene in the 1990s. So we knew some good practices about leadership. We did. We knew them. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, with all of these pressures to achieve results and to get work done and to control this sort of human factor, and I hope you're kind of thinking about your own experience in the business world right now or in the world of work, it was easier to use the big boss approach. Um, the big boss approach of a lot of telling, a lot of directing, a lot of fear. Um, I'll give you just one really quick. I had a boss one time who I was struggling. I was I was a leader in this space too. I'd been promoted into leadership in the 90s. And, and here I was trying to make it as a leader. And I was struggling with an employee on my team. And so I turned to my boss and I asked her um, for some help in that. And she said, you know, Jackie, I've never had to fire anyone in my time as a leader. And she was she was a few years down the road in her leadership career. And I thought, wow, so I must really have something great to learn from this person. Um, and she said, no, 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 no. I just make their life so miserable, they go away on their own. And this was the environment that I was leading in. Now, I know that um, you know there's also really great people in the workforce, but bad is stronger than good. Um, and this was sort of, this this was an element. This was absolutely part of the environment in which I was working. So I became myself kind of a scared leader, scared of the pressures on me, needing to be the smartest person in the room, needing to get results, make all the decisions. All of that pressure was on me. And I know that you experienced some of that yourself. So here I was trying to use good leadership practices because that was my instinct. But I was living in this world of we have a more of a fear of missing results or making a mistake than we have a love of innovating and solving problems. So this um, there wasn't really a leadership approach or practice that could really help me out in that space. So I, I was a leader for about 10 years in that environment, just really struggling with all of those pressures and looking for something that would help me be a better leader. I ultimately ended up walking away from leadership and trying some new things in my life. And one of the new things that I tried was coaching. I learned how to coach. I went through a coaching program and I learned how to coach. And I'm going to tell you when I learned how to coach, it changed absolutely everything.
in terms of how I think about leadership and in terms of how I lead today. So I'm gonna leave you with that cliffhanger that, you know, having gone through all of that, what are you, when are I you learned how to coach, side-ish, side-ish. everything. So Courtney, I know you have a story too. So let's hear your story before we, we dive into what coaching really is all about. Yeah, absolutely. So those of you that are just meeting you for the first time and those of you that know me, I'm a change practitioner by background and trade. I've done change management for well over 20 years um, and I'm certified in a couple of different change management methodologies. And when I went through a very large one, uh, ProSci, I was going to not say it and try to sign, say something that rhymes with ProSci and be funny, but nothing rhymes with ProSci. Um, so I'll say ProSci. ProSci. Shmosai, shmosai. Um, when I went through my ProSci certification, I got a lot of tools, learned a ton, very valuable, and I, I believe in ProSci very highly. Um, but when it came, when, it, when you got past the planning and the impact assessment and the spreadsheets, there was like a page and a half in the curriculum that said, train everybody and coach them when they get stuck. And it seemed like I, was, I kind of remember like being a little, you know, my anger is my go-to emotion. So I remember being a little irritated, like all the direction around change management says, if you have communications that aren't understood, go coach people. If you have people stuck in the training and they can't do the skills, go coach people. When you have attitude or morale impacts because of your change, go coach people. And they never taught you in the training how to do that. And it seemed kind of important. <laughs> If that is the road, um, how come nobody, how come the certification doesn't include teaching you how to do that? Which is why our curriculum now does have skills and we teach people how to coach because it's one of the influencing skills that's really important. So I left my pro size certification and got on a path to go get my coaching certification. And I, it is really like, we, we're, we're not, we're kind of being, you know, we're marketing, we put things like it's going to change your life and it's. Um, a superpower skill, but coaching honestly took me from being like a change project manager with a spreadsheet to after I got my coaching certification, I became an influencer in their organization. I knew how to build plans that actually went at the heart of impact. I knew how to, to have conversations with people that helped them set down their loss and their irritation. Uh, I learned how to coach leaders who do the same thing. And so I went from someone with a spreadsheet to someone who actually was a true change influencer and can build plans and help people create change that sticks. And that skill is what allows me to do that. I, I learned that I actually always been kind of coaching at some level. Um, that's what made me good to begin with. But when I actually learned the skill, got the words for it, got practice, got feedback, I got better. And it's why I can drive change that sticks is because I know how to coach. Yep. All right. So it, I'm done talking about it now. That's the end. I, I sense that. Thank you. Oh, did you? I dropped the mic. You can pick it up. And this is a bit of a drop the mic moment, I think, as they go in, you know, these noon webinars. Um, so the question is then if coaching is so great, if coaching is so effective, if we advance on our slides here, Kim, um, why aren't we all doing it? Like, we just told a couple of stories. Mine was much longer and ram more rambly than Courtney's. Um, but we just told you the story about how we ourselves went on a journey to try to influence the world in a new and different way. And it wasn't until we discovered coaching that some really amazing things started happening. So let's talk about what gets in the way. Why hasn't coaching really taken the business world by storm, if you will? I know a lot of you know about it, and you, you probably had some some experiences with it, but why hasn't it really upended the business world? So let's take a look at a few of those um, here. If we go to the next, there, well, there's a lot of reasons. <laughs> and they fall into these sort of categories, myths, barriers, and stigma. Um, myths is exactly what they sound like. You're believing something that isn't true about coaching. There are a lot of myths about coaching out there. And then there are barriers, um, just flat out things that get in the way of you either learning how to coach or being coached, like just real barriers that get in the way, probably connected to some of the myths, but there are real barriers in your time and resources that get in the way of you going any further in this space. And then finally, there's stigmas. 
Um, there's stigmas attached to this. There's stigmas attached with coaching. There's stigmas attached even with being a coach, like the stigma of how does that make you feel? Like, you know, becoming sort of this therapist like person <laughs> that you just think doesn't jive with the business world. So let's um, let's do another reveal here and let's take a look at some of those. Here's some of the things that we sort of um, narrowed it down to. Um, so Courtney, and I'll, I'll ask you to jump in here too, but just you, you can see all of these things that tend to be getting in the way of you either learning to coach, being coached, and entering into this world of coaching that we're talking about. So maybe some of these are familiar to you. Yeah. I think what's interesting, and we, if you pay attention, if you say to someone, hey, let's go grab an ice cream, let's go get a beer, everyone knows where you're going and knows what, what to go get. If you say, hey, have you thought about getting some coaching? You bump into this stuff. Like people don't, really know what it is. They say they don't have time. I think the stigma around like, it's not easy for people to ask for help. It's not easy. I think we have used coaching to fix our broken. And so if I, if someone offers me a coach, it must be because they think I'm broken. I'm sure. And you guys take a minute, you know, even on your own, while we're talking through this and think about like, what's in your way? Like, what do you think comes up either your trying to, I know I have HR people on here. Like you're trying to get a coach for someone. Um, you're, you're, you're a coach yourself and you're trying to help them. Like there are things that probably all of these threads are twisted together a little bit and it creates this lack of clarity, confusion. And I would say even like resistance around coaching and it's, it's, if we can't get to the good part, we got to understand what's in the way. So we start to be able to break that down. Jack. Yeah, I, I'm guessing that many of you are identifying with some of these of what's getting in the way of really going any further with this. Um, but one of the, you know, I think as Courtney mentioned there, one of the things is that we don't really understand fully what it is. We have ideas about what it is that aren't necessarily true. So what we're hoping to help you out with today is to give you um, a true sense of what coaching is. So some of these these things that are getting in the way can start to dissolve for you um, so that you can press further into the world of coaching, whether that's being a coach or being coached. Um, so should we take a look at? Yeah, and you're very welcome to put ideas of what you guys think gets in the way in the chat. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this. And let's let's move into what coaching is and what it's not. Sometimes it's helpful to see what something is when you think about what it's not. Um, so Kim, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. And what coaching isn't. So when you think about the myths, the barriers, the stigma of everything gets rolled together, one of the things that's affecting us is let's go to the next slide. This idea of the athletic coach mm -hmm. and culturally we have all either been a part seen, so, you know, some people like my husband, you're addicted, like you watch sports, there's an athletic coach there. And that is a very particularly known person in our lives and they do certain things and they're, it's extremely valuable, right? An athletic coach is an athletic coach. And just, just don't get those two things crossed up. There's a difference between your sport athlete coach and what we're talking about when it comes to corporate leadership coaching, um, both valuable, but they're doing different things. And I think sometimes it's hard for people to understand what they're getting and how it looks to get a business coach because we have this historical knowledge and experience with our athletic coaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we're never interested. We teach coaching a lot. And I, I often ask, you know, start in the classroom. I, I ask the question of when I say coaching, what comes to mind for you? And it's inevitable that someone will reference athletic coaching um, and we're not here to get into an argument of semantics. I mean, those coaches are our coaches. I mean, they own that word coaching. Um, it's just a different, it's just a different kind of coaching. So we're hoping, you know, the, the point of bringing this up with you is not to disparage that there's anything wrong with athletic coaching. They're not doing it right because they're certainly doing it right for the world that they live in. But we want to have you um, set aside a little bit, not use athletic coaching as a full analogy or primer on what we're talking about in terms of what it means to coach people's performance in the workplace. So let's get a list here on the screen of what coaching is not. And I'm going to just 
let those words soak in for just a few seconds with you. I'll just kind of slow roll this because I know you are now seeing those words on the screen and maybe some of them are even surprising you just a little bit, maybe some more than others based on some of the experiences that you've had with coaching, being coached or coaching others. Maybe you have made some of these things a part of that engagement. Maybe there was a lot of telling. Maybe you've associated mentoring. And I know many of you work in organizations where you probably have mentoring programs that you've associated mentoring with coaching and even use those words synonymously. Um, and we assure you they are not. We want to sort of unpack how these, none of these, these verbs here that you see on the screen are coaching, not our definition of coaching. Um, so Courtney and I will kind of just roll through these and, and give you a sense of, of what we mean by these. But before we do that, I also want to make it really clear that what you see on the screen here, telling, mentoring, teaching, advising, those are all perfectly appropriate and valuable leadership actions. They're just not coaching. Those are all perfectly appropriate and valuable leadership actions. As a matter of fact, if you think of each one of these, telling, um, uh, leaders do a ton of telling. It's called direction setting. It's, it's, um, it's, it's oftentimes involved in clarifying um, and ensuring that people do what they need to do. It's oftentimes used when things are really urgent, um, when there is just one, one course of action and it needs to be taken. You will be telling. It's, a, it's an incredibly valuable and appropriate leadership action. Mentoring, teaching, advising, all of those things are have a time and a place. And you'll do a lot of those things as a leader. And they're just not coaching. Courtney, what would you add to any one of these to help clarify so, this? Yeah. So the thing, when you look at the list of words of what coaching is not versus what coaching is, what you're going to notice that's unique is that where you are in that story. So when I'm telling, when I'm mentoring, when I'm teaching, when I'm advising, I have the answers. I have the skills. I have the experience. I have the expertise. And so the moment that you are bringing you into that person's, I call it their box, right? You're telling them, you're mentoring them, you're teaching them. When you are involved in that process, at that moment, you're using a skill, you're helping them, but you are not coaching. Coaching is about pulling yourself out of that interaction and being curious, asking questions and unlocking what is within another person the answers, the experience, the solutions don't come from you as the coach. They have to come from the person on the other side of the conversation. And so that's why one of the key attributes of a successful coach is belief in others. You have to believe that they can find the answer. You have to believe they can reach their potential. You have to believe that with enough help, right? Resourcing time that they can solve their own problems. And it's, it's coaching is as much not doing as it is doing, like resisting the urge to give the answer, allowing people to struggle, trusting that it's their thing to figure out and not yours. That that's how you coach. And you don't do that in a way that's um, abusive, right? Like you, if you have the answer, you tell them the answer, but there's some things, and I do this with my kids all the time, right? My advice is not the answer they want. My best resource for them is to help them think about what they need and what they have and where they're going and letting go of the control of that, quite frankly, is just really, really hard. It's one of the hardest things you have to learn to do as a coach. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm, we're following the chat, by the way. So if any of you want to post your thoughts in the chat, I see Phil, you have given us the idea that that coaching is listening. So you're getting us ahead. Um, but thank you for a nice seg. We'll get there. We will talk about some of the underlying skills of what coaching is. And Phil, you were, we will be very satisfied to find that listening is a big part of, of, of coaching. Um, I'm also getting some private messages from folks who are admitting, maybe not that not wanting to do quite so publicly, that they use, uh, they sort of conflate um, the things that you're seeing here on the screen and call themselves coaches or tell themselves that they are coaching others when what they are primarily doing is one of these things that you see on the screen here, telling, mentoring, teaching, or advising. Again, nothing wrong with these actions that you see there. 
Um, they just are not, as Courtney just described, they're, they're not really fully loaded with the, um, with the spirit of what coaches really use to bring out the best in others. So let's, let's advance here again and take a look at what coaching is. Um, so here's a definition, and I don't know if it will really sas satisfy you that this is the definition of coaching. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper and unpack coaching a little bit more, but coaching is, um, it's about coming from a place that is focused on others. As Courtney just said, um, it's about not having the answers. Um, it's about helping people do all of those things that you see. They're achieving their goals, identifying what's in the way, identifying their blocks, um, unleashing their energy, um, you know, really helping people to dig deep and find what they've got um, to put out there in the world and being accountable to make the changes that are needed to do that. So coaching has all of those effects. Coaching gets after all of that. But I think it's really important here, again, to just pause on um, coaching is about others. It's about maximizing the performance of others. It's about helping people to learn versus teaching. That may, you know, for some of you might, that might sound just like a little bit of sleight of hand, but it's in practice, it's actually far different. Helping someone to learn is actually a far different action than teaching. Teaching says, I have the answers. Helping someone to learn is about taking action to help someone see the world around them and what's in it and what are the lessons in it to be learned. There's, 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 a, there's actually quite a difference in that, helping someone to learn rather than teaching. It's giving power to or taking power with as opposed to having power over. Any Brene Brown fans out there will have heard her talk about power to or with versus power over. Coaches never have power over the person that they are coaching. Coaches see themselves specifically in the role of power with or giving power to um, instead of having power over. Um, it, you know, one of the words on the previous slide was it, it's not advising. And I love the statement of your advice is not as good as you think. Gosh, we all love to just have our nuggets of wisdom. And we always think that they're exactly what people need to hear. Um, but it's just your advice nine times out of 10, maybe more than that, maybe 9.9 .9 times out of 10. It's just not as good as you think. It's not as complete. It's not as aligned. It won't resonate as much as you think. Um, one of the tricks that we frequently give here is in any conversation you're having, I want you to start noticing how quickly you tend to want to give advice. Do that today. Like you've got, there's some hours left in the day today. Write a little post-it note to yourself and the next meeting that you get onto, you, you probably got a meeting in half an hour here. I want you to just, just notice, this is just a little mind game you can play with yourself. I want you to notice how rapidly you jump to wanting to give advice. Is it within 10 seconds? 25? It's probably within the first minute, which is why we give this advice of when you're in a conversation, try to wait 60 seconds before offering any advice. A lot of people sort of scoff at what, like a minute. What's that's not that's not any time at all. I want you to start noticing how quickly in a conversation before you want to give advice. And then just don't. Just lay down, let it pass, see if you can get see if you can get through an entire conversation without giving advice. It's not as good as you think. Courtney already mentioned um, the idea of believing in others. Um, there's no way to come at coaching with if you have limited belief in other people. Um, really great coaches believe in others as much as they believe in themselves. And that's a skill and you can practice doing that. And I want you to do that. I want you to really start thinking about the other person in a conversation and Think about the potential they have to, to innovate, to solve problems, to delight customers, and start believing them as much as you believe in yourself. Marty, what would you add to any of this? So there is a distinction between, I call it the, the big C coach and a little C coaching verb. And the big C coach is like, I'm going to go hire someone to coach me right? You hire an executive coach, you hire a transition coach, you hire a life coach. When I am the coach in that place and people hire Jackie and I to be their coaches, we have the super advantage of not being tied 
to the actions of the person. So I can purely can show up, coach you and be totally detached from the outcome. If you quit your job and that's the best thing for you, I'm for it. If you go have the difficult conversation, I'm for it. If you avoid the difficult conversation, I'm 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 good for you. Like I am there to help you and I'm completely detached from what you do. When I'm a leader who's using the same skill to coach my people, one foot is in that person's box. <laughs> right? You work for me. I need you to fix this skill. I need you to be to work on time. I like, I need to hold you accountable to the things I'm asking you to do. And I can use the coaching skill to help you get a plan to figure that out. I can use the coaching skill even to set expectations, but I'm not without attachment to the outcome because you performing at a high level actually impacts me right? My, my job is dependent on you doing a good job. And so one of the things that is very, like, I just want you, one of the things as we define coaching is for y'all to realize there's a difference between someone external being hired to coach extremely valuable. And we use the same skill set, by the way, to help someone if we're in your environment or outside it. But the experience of being a leader as a coach is very different because you do not get to sever yourself from the outputs and the um, reactions of what that person does. And so teaching leaders to coach, figuring out how to use these skills within the environment where you are always gonna be somewhat attached to the outcomes. That's a, that's a curriculum we haven't built here yet. I wanna put a plug in. If anyone wants to do leader as coach in your organization, we have all the ideas, all the content. We're just waiting for a customer to ask us to do it. So if you wanna be the first, give us a call. Um, and we've taught it before, like we've taught it many times and, and making that distinction, we believe leaders are great when they can coach, but we can't just treat them like, you know, you can't run them through the same program as an executive coaching class. It's just a little bit different nuance to be in and of the environment where the person you're trying to help works. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you guys have questions about that, shoot them at us, Jackie. I don't know if I, if there's anything you want to clarify or add to what I'm talking about there, but it's a very important thing to make a, a distinction about because the, when we apply the coaching verb in those two different roles, either as a, as a standalone executive coach or as a leader, as a coach, there are some very different, it's actually much harder to be a leader as a coach than an executive coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It is an important distinction. So thank you for that. I'd love to hear from people, um, from all of you, uh, how, if any of you navigate that space and how you do it. One of one of the tips that I give to people who are what we call the little C coach, meaning that you're you coaching as a part of your leadership job, not because you have a job as a coach, um, is to what you detach from, it, as Courtney described, clearly is not the outcome. You cannot detach from the outcome because that outcome <laughs> is related to your outcome. I know, I'm listening to Um. So you can't detach from that outcome. But what, what we do help people understand, there is, there is some detachment that can happen and should happen, even when you are a leader as a coach. And what I describe this as detach from the person's story. Detach from the person's story. Okay, you know what it's like when you get into a performance conversation with someone and there's all sorts of he said, she said, this happened, then that, and here's what I'm thinking, and you know, all of that, what we call the story essentially, is to stop arguing the story. Stop arguing the story. Um, this is kind of falls into the advice is not as good as you think. And and one of the things that we know is that facts and data don't resolve feelings. <laughs> And that all coaching is based on feeling. Um, and so the, the thing that we'll ask you as, a, as even a little C coach or leader as coach is to detach from needing to be right in the moment. Detach from needing to argue the story and instead focus on the feeling. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about that here in just a second, but I want to just detach from the drama. I love that, Sarah. I'm just, I'm just taking a look at the, um, at the, the chat right now. Um, yeah. yeah, I want to make one comment about um, Steph's comment about leaders don't get training on coaching. That is a very simply stated thing, and it's a huge deal. When we when people come to us and say, "What kind of training do my leaders need?" We get asked for, you know, how do you have a crucial conversation? We get asked to teach them how to do business acumen. We get sometimes we get asked for soft skills. People 
have not come to us and said, you know, my organization needs more empathy, but they do ask for emotional intelligence. I don't know, Jack, I might be wrong and you can think of an example, but I cannot remember ever being asked to teach their leaders to coach. I've been asked to coach leaders again, right? They're like, okay, let's hire that out. Go get someone to do it. But I, I, I think it falls into the same place where we started this conversation is there are things in the way people don't understand what coaching is that blocks them from knowing like, this is like, if, if we only taught your people one thing, we'd want to teach them to coach and everything else would fall into place. Um, yeah. But there's a lot between those needs and what people think the problem is and therefore what they think the solution is. Yeah. Um, to answer your question quite directly, no, I never been asked to teach leaders to coach. Um, I do we it. have done it on our own because we knew the yeah. need, but we've never. Yeah. So it, it just puts a fine. I think it just puts more context around the comment that Steph was making that it, you know, um, it, you're right. You know, I'm just putting it together now completely unrehearsed here, by the way, a little chat between Courtney and I, um, is I just got a request just this morning in my inbox to teach emotional intelligence. And um, I think people dance around coaching by making requests like that because they don't really know what coaching is and what it can do. And hopefully you'll take away from this and take our stories and start to understand that coaching is a set of skills. And let's go ahead and advance to the next slide so we can start to demystify what these set of skills really are. There's a lot of words on this on this slide, and we'll dig into some of this, but we'll let you start reading as we're talking here. Um, these There are some core skills. Professional coaches use these skills. Professional coaches use these. You know, you, your high-paid, high-end executive coaches um, use the same set of skills that you're seeing right here. Coaching is coaching is coaching. Um, and, it, you know, these skills are just dripping with what one would call emotional intelligence skills. So I think a lot of those requests, Courtney, come through. I think you're right about that. They come through more as like um, help our people understand emotional intelligence or resilience or tough conversations or, you know, the, these are sort of the standard types of requests when I think what we're suggesting to everyone here is um, I want you to start thinking about offering the skill of coaching to your leaders because so much of that tough conversation, emotional intelligence, all of those things just sort of wrap into this, this thing we call the ability to coach, to essentially show up in every conversation as a coach. That's right. And the three, there's, there's always more to everything, but the three essential skills of coaching are listening, acknowledging, validating, and asking questions, being curious. And to, to kind of start to clear the chart, the listening, like we all listen, we're human being, we have two ears, um, but you all know the degree to which we listen varies from person to person, right? And I think cell phones and, you know, hyper rewarded busy culture adds to this, you know what it feels like to go out for drinks or dinner with a friend who really listens and one who's like, you know, on their cell phone every two seconds. I hope, you know, depending on the day, you don't know who I'm, you're going to dinner with, you even go with me. Um, and some of the challenge of listening are that environment. It is very difficult with beeping and buzzing and, you know, noise around to actually focus on another person. Mm -hmm. But you also know, having been truly listened to what it means to be heard. Like listening, truly listening is the equivalent of being loved, right? To connect to someone and hear their story is the greatest way that we care about people. And one of the things that gets in the way of that sometimes is our own judgment. And you actually see this playing out at a larger scale um, politically where it's hard for you know two different sides to hear each other. Because one of the things we do is we take our own experience, our own judgment, our own experience, and we run it through our judgment filter. And the first thing we do is start to reject someone else's story. Our, one of our first responsibilities in listening is to accept whatever that person's story is with their point of view, that it is valid and it is real. Our first hardest responsibility is when someone tells you their truth is to believe them. That can't have happened to you. That that wasn't that thing. That can't be true. It, believe them. Believe that they have a different life history, a different experience, a different history. I said history already. That's okay. History often repeats itself. So do I. <laughs> believe that had you 
grown up where they grew up, had the education they had, had the family they had, and that thing happened to them that maybe you might have the same exact reaction. And that's hard to do. As human beings, we are wired for belonging. We are wired for our tribes. And our truth is what is is what we experience every day. And that takes practice to notice when your judgment is popping up and saying, oh, no, uh that didn't happen. That can't be true. That didn't really, I don't believe that. Why not? Staying present yeah. is tough. And probably the other one, we actually saw a, a training recently where the advice was prepare your next question. We don't believe in that. You be present and your question will follow. It is, if you are spending time in your head trying to figure out what you're going to say, what you're going to ask, what you're going to do next, guess what you're not doing? Listening. One of the things that I would love to add into that, um, one of the things that sort of demystified this for me, or maybe not demystified, but helped me see this differently, is in an answer to the question of what are you listening for? What are you listening for? And oftentimes we believe that we're listening for the story. <laughs> and sometimes, I mean, certain times you are absolutely listening for the story. By the way, this is one of those times. You should be listening to, you should be doing what we call um, uh, uh, me-focused listening, right? Um, which is, you should be, every every word that Courtney and I are saying should be passing through your filter of do I agree with that? Is that helpful to me? What do I think of that? How does that gel with what I already know? It's very me focused listening. Your filters are up and on and active as they should be because you are in the act of learning right now, not in the act of coaching. You are not in the act of coaching right now. So you have very me focused listening and that's appropriate. The other kind of listening that Courtney is talking about here is, um, is not me focused listening. It's, it's just, it's the, it's other focused listening. And so then the question is begged of what are you listening for? Well, it's not necessarily their story. You're going to hear the story. And presumably if you're speaking the same language, um, you're going to understand the story. You're going to understand that what happened then. And then he said, then she said, and then this happened. And then that went down and then this data came in or whatever. You'll hear the story, but that's not actually what you're listening for. You're listening for how is the other person thinking and feeling about their story. That's what you're listening for. You're listening for the unseen subtext of their story, which is how do they feel about their story? And that, that changes everything in terms of how you listen. And it forces you then into much more the role of a coach because coaches, you don't coach the story. You coach the feeling or the energy behind the story, that's actually what you coach. I know that got a little bit out there, but I encourage you to give that a try. It's 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 a, it's kind of one of those things that's a little bit harder to explain than it is to just to give it a try. The next time you're in a conversation with someone, and by the way, you're not always coaching, right? You are just sometimes you are absolutely just in a, you know, an intellectual conversation with someone, but give it a try. See if you can hear sort of past the words. And, and one of the best ways to do that is to simply ask yourself the question, not out loud, because this would be weird, um, <laughs> is to just ask yourself the question, I wonder what that person is feeling right now. I wonder what they're thinking and feeling right now. So beyond, you know, sort of the context of the story, the puts and the takes of the story, just allow your, your brain to just sort of lightly hold that question, not out loud, but just ask yourself the question, I wonder what they're thinking and feeling. When I teach this, I always encourage people, try it right now. I'm talking. Just let yourself wonder. I wonder what Jackie's thinking and feeling right now. Is she nervous? Is she excited? Is she, what is she? Give it a try. Take a guess. See if you can see if you can find yourself wondering and thinking about what I'm thinking or feeling. Yeah. Yes, and Sarah, I, you brought up the word empathy. You are dead right, which takes us to acknowledge and validate. Yeah. Um, so so when you yeah, when you've identified that feeling. The, the very, the next step of the coaching process is to acknowledge and validate it. And this, the reason it's the first step, it's always required. It's a huge part of coaching is as human beings, we have a core need to be seen and heard and understood. And so Acknowledge and validating in, in one hand is super simple. Like when that person says, I'm feeling sad, or you know they're feeling sad, you you made that assumption that you you recognize that they're frustrated, that you recognize they're mad, to say to them, 
I can see you, right? Whatever that I can see you're frustrated. It's understandable. You'd be mad right now. You're obviously upset. Like I can see you that you use words that say, I see you because we need to meet that human need to be seen and heard. Now, one of the things that gets in the way is sometimes we acknowledge like we don't agree with the emotion. Like someone's upset, they're mad, they're angry, they're hurt. And we were like, why would you be upset or angry or hurt about that? Like our own judgment gets in the way of, of feeling comfortable, acknowledging and validating it because we don't agree. And let me tell you another little secret of, of coaching and the power of acknowledging and validating is you don't have to agree with it to acknowledge and validate it and see someone. You can, empathy is not an endorsement. There you go, Jack. Like the idea that when someone, I, I told this story recently, I'll tell it again because it, it's only about a month old. Um, my youngest daughter had some trouble with her roommate and the roommate was going to move out. And this had been going on for a couple of weeks. They weren't getting along. Like she knows the roommate's going to move out. And she called me the day the girl was moving out and she was really upset. Like she was really, really upset. She was crying. She was anxious. She was worried. And I was like, I don't get it. Like this girl's been living on other people's couches for two weeks. Did you think she was going to do that forever? Like, of course she's going to move out. What is going on here? Why are you upset? I had all sorts of judgment, right? All sorts of like, I don't agree with being mad right now. I don't agree with being, I really don't understand being surprised right now. I didn't, I didn't agree or understand any of it. And even with all that judgment, I could say, I, I can hear you're upset. It's understandable that someone who has a big change happening would be upset. I didn't do any of that because I'm her mother, but you know, with coaching client, I would. Um, and it's that, I hope it, the, the story is intended to bring out that, that example of like, we can say to someone, I see you and it's understandable. And anyone in your situation would feel that way. And that's absolutely true without saying, I feel that way. I would do this. It's not about me. I'm not in your box. And that takes some practice to see someone and to validate them. But it is the most powerful thing we do. Because when we acknowledge and validate, when we see someone, that human need that needs to be seen and heard, and until it's seen and heard, it just stays in that emotion. If I'm anxious, if I'm worried, if I'm scared and no one sees it, I stay there. But when someone sees it, they acknowledge and validate it, I can set that down. And this is why, why coaching is such a huge part of change, is people have lost things that triggers emotion until we create an experience where we allow them to set the old stuff down. They can't grab onto the new stuff. Right. And so we say, I see you. It's understandable. Tell me more about that. Create a lane where people can be seen and heard and validated. And it's, and let them talk about it. Let them burn up that little, you know, oil lamp that is their anger. Let them burn up that little thing in their gut that is their fear. Let them get those words, the words that are stuck in their throat out. And it's, it's powerful and it's magical and it's simple where, once they've done that, they leave your office, your conversation lighter and more open to something new, to something different. And we can't do it if we judge it. We can't do it if we think that they're wrong to have that feeling. Or we can't tell them in the Sydney example, right? If we do, then I'm in trouble. Right? Please fire questions about this, Jackie. What would you add? Well, um, one of the things I would add, I already put in the um, chat, which is unlike Courtney, who failed in the moment for her daughter. I actually showed encourage... her pretty well. <laughs> we do encourage you to try these particular skills at home. Um, they are really powerful for opening people up. Like we, we strike the difference between armor up and open up. Armoring up puts people in the defensive crouch to defend their, you know, to defend their actions and to protect their ego. When you use acknowledge and validate, which is really just an applied form of empathy, um, you get people to open up. It's not magical. They'll still hold on to a few things and be a bit, you know, and, and might not be just willing to fully open up in that moment. But I will guarantee that if you don't do it, they will not open up and you will never get them on the path of being open to trying something new, thinking of some new ideas, which is of course the very next thing that coaching does. 
which is to um, which is to get you to look forward, get the person being coached to look to the future and make different decisions to get what you want, to meet your objectives, to try something new, to set down what's not working. And you'll never get there if in the very first bit of the conversation, instead of acknowledging and validating because you see that as endorsement, um, and you don't want to endorse someone who's doing something you wouldn't do because you're too afraid of that. Instead, you'll close them down, you'll pass judgment, you'll give your advice, you'll tell them what to do, and you have, you have in that moment, you have missed the opportunity to get someone to make a deep, lasting change and commitment uh, and, and new direction, Ex you know, which is precisely what you actually want the person to do. Yeah. So there's a bit of shooting yourself in the foot by not doing that. Yeah. So the final step is, is, is questions. And I think questions, Courtney, is what people most associate with coaches. Yeah. <laughs> That's where we get the sort of like, and how does that make you feel sort of yeah. therapist idea. So say and more about yeah. So questions are all about practicing curiosity and they're designed to trigger the right brain. So this is a you know little brain science behind this. We say empowering questions. Um, think open-ended questions, right? Questions that don't have a particular right, you know, a right or wrong answer. Um, when we ask close-ended questions, um, yes, no questions, how many questions, we trigger the left brain. The left brain is designed for analytics and the left brain, like it, it's kind of finds an answer and it spits it out and it's done. What we want to trigger is the right brain because in our right brain, that's where our creativity or our problem solving and our potential lies. And so when we ask an open question, what have you thought about? What have you tried? What might work in this situation? How do you feel about it? like we, we, we create space for the brain to start solving a more complex problem. And, and the biggest thing we do is we create the moment that triggers on and we trigger a right brain question, we establish ownership with the person we're asking the question of to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And I'll say like, we now think about that compared to remember the list of tell, teach, mentor, direct, Who's accountable to solve the problem when I'm in the equation? When I use those other skills as the leader, it's my problem to teach them enough. It's my problem to tell them the answers. It's my problem to figure this up, right? So all the ownership and accountability for getting the work done when I use those other skills is still on me. When I ask empowering questions, when I shift the ownership for solving them to the person in front of me, I start to share accountability. I establish ownership with the person in front of me to figure it out. I actually grow my team because now they can solve a problem. And there's two of us that can solve those kind of problems, not just one. Mm -hmm. Empowering questions, open-ended, designed to put the ownership, curiosity, problem-solving responsibility on the person in front of you. And it works because I believe they can do it. It's in them to figure this stuff out. I'm here to help. Yeah. A couple of things that we often teach around empowering questions, so just a couple of bits of advice here, since we are actually in an advising mode right now um, and not a coaching mode, is uh, you'll hear a lot about this. Try to avoid asking why questions. Mm -hmm. You'll All the examples that Courtney just sort of threw out, you were all what questions or how questions. Those are really great. We love what and how when it comes to asking empowering questions. So much so that if you ever coach with me, you may notice I have this tendency because I generally am, I'm not perfect at this, but I'm generally really focused on you when you're talking to me and I'm trying to kind of get a sense of what you're thinking and feeling. And so when you stop talking, there's this awkward silence because I have not been thinking about my next question. And I will feel that awkward silence sometimes with, I'll just do one of these things like, so what? And then I'll think of the question that I want to ask. So I almost like give myself the a lead in of like, forcing myself to ask a what or how question. And I might switch it up, you know, to like, well, and so how? <laughs> um, so just what or how are really powerful ways. It's just, it's, it's, it's a trick, if you will. It's not an absolute, it's just a little trick. Focus on the what and the how and avoid the why. Why has a tendency to get people to think backwards, to look back over their shoulder as opposed to forward. To get a, they can get into more of a defensive crouch then. There's no, there's no super rule on this. It's just maybe just a little bit of a, of, of a trick um, or a habit. Why does trigger 
why the, why does trigger the left brain as well? So it's going to take you to the to an answer and a route. Um, Jackie asked me what was I thinking all the time is probably not an empowering question, but that's a different well, um, conversation. I actually when I actually say it, what the hell were you thinking? Which is really just a why question. Um, and but you know what? One of my favorite questions to ask is why is that important to you? Which is a really great, powerful, quite an empowering question to ask. So there's, I mean, there's no absolutes around this. The other bit of advice I'll, I'll, I'll throw in here, Courtney, is, we, you know, we get into this sort of question, like we get into this mode of like, okay, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. I can do this. And then you ask this question. You're all going to recognize it. Have you tried X, Y, Z? That's really just advice with a question mark attached. And when you hold power, if you're the person with the power differential in, in, the, in the conversation, you just gave advice. In fact, you may have just given a mandate. You may have just done a tell. Um, so that that one I do encourage you to, to uh, yeah, yeah. Don't no, no advice with question marks attached. We see right through it and it doesn't, you don't get credit for it. <laughs> That's really good. Awesome. All right. These are skills that we can teach you a lot more about, but at a high level, hopefully really gets the juices flowing, gets you thinking. Um, Jack, I'll let you go ahead and wrap us up. Sure. So, hey, maybe we've sort of what's your appetite for if you need some coaching. I think you picked up on the fact that Courtney and I are both leadership coaches, leadership coaches, transition, change, all of those things. We can coach around all of those things. So if you are interested, um, give us a call. And right now, you're, it's your lucky day. If you want to sign up now, we are um, through the end of the year. We're running a little bit of a discount on our coaching packages. And if you've got multiple people in your organization that are interested in signing up, this would be a really great time. It could deepen your savings. Um, and they would coach with us, one of the two of us. And the choice is yours. Um, so do think about that. Um, and I think we have just a recap in, on the next slide. Uh, yeah, and just think about all of these things. Courtney already, you know, admitted that we are in some real thinking space around um, how we can help organizations teach their leaders to coach. I will tell you that the truth of leading others, one of the one of the services that we provide, one of the products that we provide. Um, we do have a coaching element, teaching leaders to coach inside that program, but we're also thinking about just creating sort of a standalone teach you to coach, really do some deep dive and some work with your leaders. Um, so our, our list of products, I guess, is you, I guess what I'm saying is it's always growing and we're always looking for people to tell us how we can help. And, and, um, and if you are interested in working with us on any of those things, do let us know. And then otherwise just follow us. You can see that you can find us on LinkedIn and Facebook. And I think that's Instagram. I'm not sure. I'm not much of a social media person. Terrible. Um, <laughs> so do follow us. You did us. great. Thanks. I know. <laughs> Whatever that little symbol is. And, um, you know, Instabook. <laughs> Instabook. I don't know. Um, yeah. You can see our Jack chats and our shot cast and we're just loaded with all kinds of silly Content, and interesting. Yeah things to um to say about leadership so please do join us and i think that's i think that's where we're going to leave it today all right so thanks for joining us um any, if we got just a couple of minutes we're happy to hang out and answer any questions um if you want to take yourself off mute you could do that now but 